Raring to go. All right, y'all. This is Mike Robertson Q&A. This is November 13th, 2017. Uh, rules are, if you're not talking, please mute your mic or please have headphones in or do both as a fail safe. Um, if your speaker plays, it cuts the talker's voice out. And so it makes it really hard to hear. Um, who has any questions? I didn't have a topic in mind for today. Maybe just the topic can be questions to ask Mike Robertson. I like that topic. Cameron, you've never been to one of these. Nope. Do you have any questions? He gets his questions answered every week. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. But those are all business questions, so. Yeah. Martin, uh, how are you? Over. He's thinking about it. There we go. Hi, it's my first time here. I'm from the Philippines. Hey, the Philippines? welcome. Yeah. Awesome, I'm man. Having Thanks kind for of tuning in. Guys. <laughs> what time is it over there? Uh, it's 9.30 in the morning. Oh, that's not bad. Sorry. <laughs> good, good. I'm happy for you. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have I any questions for here. us, Martin? Uh, I can't think of right now. Maybe when I, when my mind comes up. All right, you think about it. That's okay. Yeah. Cameron, did you have one? Not at the moment, currently. Alex, you look like you got one. Yeah, I got one. He's okay, good. somebody right, step up. <laughs> here we go. Hey, Mike, how's it going? I'm good, buddy. How are you? Good. So, good. Um, currently, right now, I'm working with a football punter. Okay. Uh, he's gonna have, he has some training camp or like like NFL training camp in March. Okay. And one of the things I've noticed just assessing him is just, I mean, he's unilateral sport, right? He's, he's yeah. just his his only job is to kick the ball. Yeah. And so the compensations are like insane. I mean, it's yeah. he kicks with his right foot, mm -hmm. but he's terrible stability on his left, which should be a stance like. Right. Right. So one of the questions that I had was how would you go about training somebody like that who is their sport is so specialized. Right. You go and, and just to give some context, just assessing him, he shifts into his left significantly. Um, even when he's lunging, he's shifting to his left. Okay. Uh, so I'm just wondering, would you start him in bilateral movements or would you start kind of like his primary exercising or exercises being more unilateral? Yeah. Okay. So this is, I'm going to speak in hypotheticals cause I've not okay. trained such a uh, creature before. Sure. Um, I would say for somebody like this, I mean, I don't know, like, I always come back to like, I want to teach them the patterns, right? Like I still want to give them a squat and a hinge and you know, it doesn't have to be heavily loaded, but I'm always going to train those patterns, right? Like to some degree. But I think for a guy like this, I mean, if he's that unstable, um, you know, like even his single leg and his split stance work is going to start in like either like a split stance where he's got both feet on the ground, or we're going to go down to like half kneeling um, and we're going to try and get him stable in like those low level positions first. Um, just because, I don't know, that, that does make me a little worrisome that he's like that all over the place, um, just based on how you describe. Now, I would say a lot of times people can fake left stance, right? Like they look like they're like on their left leg, but when you look at like their zipper, it's going to the right, exactly. you know, so they're not really in left stance. It's like fake left stance. Mm -hmm. So you can definitely see that. So I would make sure that if they are going to the left, you know, like you're looking at, is the pelvis actually square? Are they actually sitting into their left hip? Can they feel their left heel? Things of that nature. Um, so that's kind of where I would start with this guy. I, I don't shy away um, from teaching a squat or a hinge to anybody, right? Because I think even if it's not sports specific, there's still just general strengthening that can be done um, to just the, the, the thigh, the hip, you know, things that'll behoove him over the course of a season. Because one thing I can tell you, 
The closest thing I've had to that is goalies. And those dudes are pretty asymmetrical and their tissue gets beat up over the course of a year, you know, cause you got to think it's a freaking high intensity effort, you know, in, in the case of a, a goalie, I mean, it could be 40, 50 kicks a game, you know, a punter is not going to kick that often, but just because they're asymmetrical doesn't mean you can't use symmetrical exercises to build a foundation for movement, to build uh, some general strength. Um, and then you can use more, the split stance and the half kneeling type stuff to build some more specific stability and control. Cause I think, like you said, if he's that unstable, a little bit of that could actually help him. It could help him anchor his left side. So then when he goes to kick with that right leg, he can really pummel that ball. So. Yeah. So, so, I mean, this guy has even given more context. This guy has had no real formal training. He's yeah. kind of just gone out there and kicked. Yeah. And, and, and that's really why, I mean, I'm seeing these, uh, conversations. Sure. So are you saying that he could still be in that left AIC pattern, even though he's shifting to his left? Absolutely. Absolutely. So how, so how would, how would that happen? <laughs> or like, or like why, why, <laughs> why would he be, he be shifting into his left, even though he's on his right? Well, you got to think, right? Like he's got to shift something. He's got to shift to his left to be in left stance, right? Right. To some degree, he's got a left, he's got to add up to the left, but that doesn't mean he's necessarily in his left hip or that he's secure in that position. Right. Right. So his pelvis could still be facing the right, mm-hmm. right. He could still be like on his left toes or on his left forefoot, not finding his left heel, his left hamstring to kind of anchor and c- cement and stabilize everything. Right. So this is super common, like, and I'm sure other people would attest to this, but like, like, one of the things Mike Cantrell said about PRI, and I'm going to, I'm going to minimally mention this, but like Mike Cantrell in a PRI course said, you know, like the dirty secret about PRI is like, not just that people are bad in left stance, but people are bad in right stance as well. Like people struggle on getting on both sides. They struggle getting in and out of both hips. So you may be seeing like a left extension or left AIC type pattern, but that doesn't mean they can't, have issues going to the left as well. For sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, so absolutely. A lot of times they have trouble getting off the right, but they have trouble stabilizing and getting into the left stance. Right. If that makes sense. So they're yeah. fake, right? Like, you know, as well as I do, people can fake a lot of things in an effort to produce a movement or in yeah. this guy's case to produce a sports specific skill. So absolutely. sounds like he's just cheating and yeah, yeah. they're going to have to do some of the basic stuff to get him to stabilize the way you want him to. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks that a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah. Cool. I like that. Anyone have any follow-ups? Hi, Jason. I managed to keep Jason here for long. <laughs> I like to see how long I can keep people at IFAST. In any I given see day. That. <laughs> we should have got you here. We could have had just one one camera running. Next time we'll do that. Yeah. I'm ready. ready. Patrick. Uh, actually, All right, here we go. I know I've heard a lot of good things about PRI. And I just know a little bit through reading through Lance's blog and just from the content at IFAST. But as a non clinician, how often do you see yourself implementing the PR, the PRI concepts? Mm. I don't know if I even think of it like, like, look, here's the thing. Like PRI is taking credit for it. Cause I think they brought a lot of it to the forefront, but I'm not sure that they necessarily, what Ron did, I feel like a good job of is synthesizing a lot of materials, but there were a lot of people that were talking about these patterns before Ron Rusker was. So, you know, like what I find myself mentioning more and more isn't necessarily PRI or um, Bill's got the other guys. I can't. Um, there's a stress pattern, Dunnington stress pattern, and there's somebody else's musculoskeletal asymmetry, whatever. Like what I find myself referencing are, you know, some of the asymmetries that we have. Um, what I find myself referencing are the common compensations that I see. Because look, at the end of the day, if it, it's one thing if you and I are having a discussion, right? But a lot of the people that I interact with, 
you know, my athletes don't necessarily care, you know, and I know that sounds bad, but they don't care why their rib cage is stuck up or why their butt is way back there. You know, they just want to know, like, how do I improve my first step or how do I increase my vert? And I know that sounds like silly, but like my job isn't, my job is to understand that, but then to, to siphon it down to a point where I can explain it to some dude that just wants to increase his vert and why this breathing exercise is important to him, you know, cause I mean, that's the biggest thing. It's not, you have to know it and you have to understand it, but most importantly, you have to have a wrap and, and Bill actually does a, an entire day of this with his PT students. It's called wrap day and you basically have to work on your sales pitch. And I think that's more important is like, once you understand this stuff, it's not trying to take it to the 99th percentile because you're a coach, right? You're not a PT. So like I always tell the people that I interact with, like get to 90%, right? Get to 90% efficiency. You don't have to know all the facial muscles and the whatever pattern is going on in your skull. Like I don't care about that. Like I need a basic understanding. I need a, a basic understanding of the patterns that I'm going to see, the compensations that are going to result. And then I need a wrap to be able to talk to any athlete, any client, and be able to sell them on why we do breathing exercises or why we do you know, these specific warm-up drills or why we choose these specific exercises in their program to help them not only correct what we would consider maybe a dysfunction or a suboptimal movement pattern, but how it's actually gonna help them over the long haul. And I think that's way more important. And I think that's where you're gonna see more people focusing like, with any new thing, people want to geek out, you know, and people will dive head first, and I get that. But ultimately, what's more important is taking that information and being able to make it relatable to the client or athlete standing in front of you. Could I ask what your rap is when you try to explain how uh, breathing or positioning is going to help your athlete's first step? It, 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 oh, first, okay. So you gave me context, because if you were just going to say, help my athletes, it's like, dude, which athlete? So I'll give you a great example. So like this kid that I'm working with right now, um, he came in and super like extended thorax, massive anterior tilt. Um, and to this guy, it's funny because after I worked with him for a while, he's like, man, my mom used to make fun of my posture because my butt stuck, stuck so far behind him. And so you got to know kind of where he's coming from. But in his world, he doesn't care about that right? Like that's just how his body is. What he cared about was improving his first step, right? So the way I explain it to him is this, like, look, dude, if these guys are on all the time, they're pulling things forward, but here's what's really important. Like when you want to make a big, powerful first step and you want to get, you know, get your shoulders around a guy or get, get past his shoulders, you can't do that because you can't separate your hips, right? So that hip flexor on, on that back leg is so stiff. I didn't even use the term hip flexor. I said the front of your hip is so stiff and the back of your hip is so weak that you can't do that. So you can't explode past your guy and get that separation that you want. I said, so look, I know this doesn't look cool, but these breathing exercises, these ab exercises that we're doing, they're going to work to loosen that up. And it's not only going to help you with that separation, but think not just separation, getting around a guy, but separation when you're going up to dump. And so immediately, if you can sell it like that, the guy's like, dude, I'm in, you know? So the way I say it, or the way I always try and explain it is this, like giving a rap to somebody in pain is easier, I think, because you know what their pain point is, right? In this case, it's like, what does this athlete want? And one of the questions I ask uh, a lot of times when I'm evaling or assessing somebody is, if I could wave the magic wand and give you one thing out of us working together, what would that be? And so if you remember that one thing and then you start using that, that could be your, the sales pitch that you come back to time and time and time again, as long as it applies, right? So that's how I think it again. And I mean, the guy, the guy has been super diligent. Like he's got his, his strength and conditioning at his school twice a week, but he still comes and I work with him twice a week on the side because he's seeing and feeling a difference. So Nice. Thanks. Yeah. Don't yep. worry. I had another question. It's not really related to this. It's a, a bit more general. Okay. 
Well, I was listening to uh, the <coughs> podcast. I think it's called the BBA podcast. Okay. And then he had um, Ryan Horn, Josh Bonnetal, and Corey Sessler. Oh, yes. I know of the show. I have not heard it, but I yes. I know have it. been on uh, your podcast also. Yeah, I've had all three of those guys on. And then he was saying how those three are like one of the top basketball college gym coaches in the country. Agreed. He said that I was wondering, I was thinking like, like what makes them like one of the top? Like what makes these three compared to the other so many college basketball string coaches out there? Like what makes these three one of the, one of the best? Okay, well, the real answer is part of it is visibility, right? Like for being really real, like people could say uh, Lance Goyke is the best assessor on the planet, you know, and part of that would just be because they know him, they like him. And they've seen his information out there, right? So part of it is visibility, just to the public's eye. And those three guys, I think, are absolutely visible. Um, like if you look at their social media, you know, Instagram, they they use that tool, right, to kind of show what they're doing, to give context to what they're doing. Um, but I mean, if you just sit down and talk to any of those guys, like listen to those guys on the shows that I did with them. And I mean, Ryan Horn and Josh, and Corey to some degree too. I didn't lay his show out quite the same, but Ryan and Josh give you the playbook, right? Like they're gonna walk you through step by step by step what they're doing in each part of their program, what they wanna get out of it. So I think, you know, it's, it's just this mixture of, you know, the amount of time they put in, um, the amount of time they've just thought about this, they, the time they've spent to tweak and refine. You can tell the way they talk, right? Like the longer you do this, you can just tell, like there's one thing to just be confident, but not really know what you're talking about, right? Like you, what you're saying, like sounds really good, but anybody that knows, like kind of knows like, eh, this guy isn't really doing this or it's not, it's not the way he makes it sound versus I just feel like if you've done this long enough, you've got this filter and there's just this realness and this authenticity in the way those guys talk. You just know, like, look, these guys know what they're doing. You can tell they've been around the block, that they're having success. And I think the interesting thing to me is, do you follow them on Instagram? Those, those yeah, guys? yeah, I follow through them. So like really watch them and like watch what they're doing and start thinking about like, okay, well, why is he doing that? Right. And, you know, I've known Josh for eight or nine years now since when he was with the Bulls. And I know his pedigree, right? I mean, Alver Meal's been there. Alec, Eric Helen's been there. So he's been with the Bulls. He's been with Purdue for a long time. Um, so I know, you know, the level he's playing at. Ryan Horn, super sharp. You can just tell start to finish. He's got a really good grasp on not just the training side, but some of the load management stuff. I mean, the things that he's doing with his guys. And Corey is, to me, arguably the most interesting and partly just because he's the newest to me. He's the one I'm the least familiar with. But he is a guy that like just watch his Instagram and see what he's doing with these guys. Cause I don't see anybody else doing this stuff. Right. Like he's got these dudes on the floor rolling, uh, you know, Turkish getups aren't a great example. Cause some people do that, but like, he's got them bending, he's got them flexing, he's got them doing bear crawls and all these athletic moves that I think these guys need. Cause these dudes are so extended. Right. And a lot of guys don't want to sit there and just fucking breathe for 30 minutes right? But they need something to start reintroducing flexion to their system. So all these things that he's doing, he jokes and he calls himself a glorified PE teacher, but like he's doing exactly what these guys need. So, I mean, you can just tell, like you talk to these guys, you watch what they're doing. It's the authenticity. It's the time they put in. Like you can just tell these guys know what they're doing. Now, does that mean they're the three best in college basketball? I don't know, man. There's like probably 300 some colleges if you count D1, D2, D3. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of really good Division I basketball strength coaches out there. But I'd say those three, if nothing else, they got to be in my top 10, you know, because eventually people figure out if you're good. And so that's part of the visibility too, right? Like it's hard to be visible if you're not putting in good work. So I don't know, really roundabout answer. Um, but you can just, I, I don't know, it's hard to tell. Like, you can just tell when you talk to them, when you listen to the way they speak, and when you see what they're doing with their athletes, that these guys know what they're doing.
for sure. Yeah, I could agree to that. Definitely, when I listen to those guys, it's like, wow, they're they're onto something. Yeah. So, yeah. And other this other people, like I guess, I don't know who else to listen to. But like, I hear those three, but then it's compared well, to them. how old are you? Can I ask? Twenty seven. Twenty seven. Don't listen to other people yet. Okay. Like the world is full of people that want to tell you how to do things. Right. And everybody's got a voice now and it's a good and a bad thing. You know, those three guys are legit, right? So start with them, let them be your filter. Right. And as you start to have a better understanding of, okay, I see why he's doing this. I see why he's doing that. As you have a better and better filter, then you can go out and, and pull from other and other people. Right. And other sources of information. But now the problem is, like there's so many people talking, like that's half the battle. It's figuring out like who actually knows what they're talking about and focusing on them versus, you know, ooh, 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 it's like shiny object syndrome, right? Like you wanna listen to everybody, you wanna give everybody an equal playing field and it shouldn't be that way. So like start with these three guys that you know are world class that are doing really good work, get a better filter and then start to listen to other people and start pulling from them. Got it, thank you. Mm-hmm. My pleasure. Beautiful. What else? I need to hydrate. It's water, not vodka. <laughs> I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> Only in Poland. <laughs> Fabrizio, you got any? I'm sure it's hard to think that early. <laughs> yeah, we're breaking his circadian rhythms. Hi, guys. Hi, Mike. Hey, buddy. Uh, how are you? Pretty good. Good, Thank man. You. Yeah. Well, in complete single leg training, uh, yep. awesome product, by the way. Uh, congratulations. I Great really model. like that. Great model. Yeah, yeah. Very athletic male model. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, in in that series, you go over uh, pistols and single leg RDLs. Yeah. Uh, as these exercises uh, stand out as the most advanced uh, single leg variations with regards to you know single uh, single leg lower body push and pull. Yeah. But um, I was wondering, what about uh, airborne lunges or scalar squats? Uh, do you like them? Do you do you use them? or they are too much hybrid of an exercises. Um, I know you like the squat to be a squat and the deadlift to be a pure yeah. hip hinge. Sure. Uh, maybe uh, you didn't include uh, airborne lunges because they're a mix of a squat and a, and a hip hinge, uh, or I don't know. When you say airborne lunges, are you talking like a, like a jump? Like a split squat jump? No, I mean when you, uh, it's like a, a, a hip hinge when you, where you put your knee on the ground, then you uh, go back up, uh, like a backward lunge. Okay. I don't know but if I've you, ever, I don't know if I've uh, ever seen it, to be honest. So that would be one reason why it's not in there, because I've never seen it. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. So here, here's one thing, like, and here's something that I tried to do with that, that product. Now keep in mind, and I think I alluded to this either in the, the video or the manual, like there's so many exercises out there, right? Like, again, it's for me, I think part of, part of doing this long enough is to try and put my blinders on, right? Like what are the things that I'm going to use the most? And so that product reflects say 98% of the split stance or single leg exercises I'll use up to this point, right? Now, if I find something else I like, then by all means, I gotta figure out where it goes in that system. Um, but for me, it's all about like having the basic exercises, having a basic progression to work from, and then kind of being able to plug and play from there. So, sorry, I, I can't help just cause I don't, I'm not really familiar with the exercise itself. When we're done, maybe could you send me a link? And I'd be I happy to one. look at it and see what it is and, and I'll try and help you out a little bit more. Of course. Okay. Can I show you one, Mike? Yes. If let's try this screen share thingy. Oh wow! Look at this. Can you see it? No, I can't see it. Okay. 
I see Let's you and Jay Jason's see. here in the background. You see that? Oh yes. That's an okay. airborne lunge. Okay. Didn't um Ian King used to have like a King deadlift or something like that a while back? I don't know. Did he? I think so. Yeah, I mean, look, here's what I like about that, Fabrizio. I love the fact that he's reaching. I love the fact that he can feel his whole foot. Um, I mean, I would, I would think that would go somewhere in, like, that single leg squat progression, you know. Just looking at it right there, I don't know where exactly. Um, probably somewhere. I mean, it's not supported, so it would be a little bit more challenging. But, yeah, it would go somewhere in there. And I don't mind anything like that. I, in fact, I like the fact that there's a little bit of torso lean too, a torso lean with a reach because that's really going to toast the quads and the glutes, right? So, and it's going to make sure the reach is going to make sure the rib cage and the pelvis are stacked. So, I actually really like that position. I'm going to have to play around with that now. So, see, so you just taught me something new, man. I should be paying you for this. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. You taught me a lot more. So, <laughs> <laughs> we'll call it even then, okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, just one last question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, do you have your athletes' uh, kettlebell swing? And if so, uh, do you go uh, as far as have them one arm kettlebell swing or just two arms? You know, I have not done a lot of swings with my athletes. Um, and it's not to say that I wouldn't. I think if I had the right athlete, I would. Um, and I, I could use it for a couple reasons, right? I could use it for some conditioning purposes. I could use it for some lower level, like non-ballistic power, right? So without taking some of the beating of jumping and landing, I like that aspect of it. Um, I would say the biggest thing is the, the struggle that I have with swinging is that a lot of athletes struggle to really understand where their spine is and load their hips consistently. Right. So if I slow it down and I put them in an RDL or, or maybe even a trap bar, I can get them where I want them, but it needs to be slow and controlled. Um, the second I start to do it repeatedly, um, the, the second I start to add speed to the equation, it gets a lot more sketchy, you know? So I think with the right athlete, I absolutely would. Um, but I'm not currently doing that. And Again, it, it's not necessarily that it's a bad thing. It's more of just a, you know, I don't know if I'm comfortable with some of my athletes and where they're at doing that. And part of the problem is too, like you got to think, a lot of the guys that I have are short windows of time, two to three months. So, you know, I might get them to a really good RDL and think I'm great with that, you know? So if you have more time, and you like the swing, by all means, feel free to incorporate it because I think there's a lot of benefit to having it in the program. Thank you so much, Mike. My pleasure, Thank man. You. Thank you. What else? Hey, Mike, just to pitch in on the, uh, on the airborne lunge, it kind of looks like okay. a skater squat. Yes. Are you familiar with those? That's kind of what it reminds me of. You know, like I've heard of a lot of these exercises. I just – they're not things that I'm necessarily familiar with. So what, that, what was that one? That was the airborne lunge. That's the airborne lunge, but it looks a lot like a skater, skater squat, skater lunge. Okay. And if you, so skater squat, I really like to use that as kind of my regression. Uh -huh. um, and I use it supported. So with the TRX. Yeah. And that, and that kind of introduces um, them kind of, in a single single leg stance essentially but allowing yeah. them to shift back into their hips because okay. um, even like so step up is a little bit more of a concentric action right for sure um so i like that as a little bit more of an eccentric um gotcha stability so, exercise um, yeah no, that makes I work, sense yeah i work with a lot of athletes um specifically in kind of like um rehabbing acl Okay. And, and I really like to use that before I get into um, single leg RDL just because they are a little bit closer to the ground. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And then you have to go dig in on these, these exercises because they're not ones that I've seen or used a ton. Yeah. So I'm going to have to definitely check them out and see uh, where they might fit into the equation. Yeah, give those a try with like tempo. 
Yeah. Just, just oxidative skate, skater squats. Oh my gosh. They're killer. That's <laughs> awful. <Yeah. laughs> All right. Just wanted to pipe in and say that. <laughs> no, that's great. I'm going to make a note so I go back and look at these. Awesome. What else, guys? What were you going to say? Hmm? Yeah. Ty Terrell. Didn't you raise your hand? I did. <laughs> there used to be a like, raise your hand button I thought on here, but I can't find it. Um, like, Mike, I can, I'm going to kind of have your back here because I know we come from the same place um, with the same kind of uh, expectations and, and standards and stuff like that. And so um, knowing your population and even, even the kids that like the athletes that I have, like to get the level of triplanar control to do a really good airborne lunge and even pistol squat or whatever, you know, even a single leg RDL, like it, you, I think for a lot of our athletes, you're, you're going to have to like lower your standards of what's acceptable. Right. Uh, to even go get there. And I'm not talking like necessarily to you, Mike. I'm actually like, I'm just like, I don't know. I hope so. I mean, if I have a kid long enough, then like I would hope so I can get them to do that, things like that. But I think you're going to see uh, a real, I mean, they're, those, the point of those exercises is to really challenge, is to increase triplanar challenge and in, 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 yeah. in control. So like I just would kind of caution to make sure they have that first before going there. Um, and, uh, like we call that a roof an airborne lunge. We call a Rufus deadlift. Oh and, yeah. Um, it's, it's named after Grant Gardas from the Blair Witch Project. And so <laughs> we just, you know, you, you hip hinge and then drop into a squat, just like you would a normal conventional deadlift. Yeah. Uh, and that's all. And, and, and so we do right there. And I mean, that's tough. Like the hips kick out frontal plane control. Every, I mean, you get that Trendelenburg thing going on. I mean, it is, yep. it is not easy to do. Yeah. I, I mean, I know you're in the kind of the same boat, Ty, but like, I just, I work with enough people and I work with enough of these athletes and especially like basketball, these long limb people, like just taking them from like, taking them into uh, like a, a step up to a cross connect and having them own the top or having them do a lunge into like a single leg support, right? So where it's aggressive and trying to own that top position, like, I mean, those positions are really challenging. Like if you, if you layer in elements of the control coming back into, say, a lunge and then being aggressive and standing up and owning that top position, there's a lot of pieces in play there. So, you know, I, when it comes to single leg stuff and split stance stuff, like, I mean, the progression that I use is something that I'm comfortable with. But by all means, like, I, I know I put this in there too. Like, don't ever feel constrained by what I tell you to do or what I use, right? Like. I think the science is sound and the progressions are sound, but by all means, if, if that exercise works for you and your population, figure out where it fits and by all means use it, you know, cause we're all different in the application. But I think if you have the core science and the foundation is there for your progressions in your system, then you can do whatever you want from there. The Blair Witch Project was the best part of the, the session so far though. So. <laughs> Ty being, being Ty. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a, a question from the purple room over here. Okay. Hi, Mike. Hi, Allison. So my question is, I was mm -hmm. looking over notes from some of the in-services that we've done with you, and um, I was looking at one of the programming ones, and I'm wondering what type of retesting do you do based off of what block you're in of programming? So the only way to know if what you're doing is to retest your work, right? So if I'm in a power block, what yes. am I specifically looking to train? If I'm in a force block or acceleration block, what am I specifically looking to train? Or is it going to be an overlap where you're looking for everything to kind of adjust? Really good question. So I will tell you this. The goal is to try and work the testing into the training, right? What I don't want to do, especially with, say, an 8 to 10-week timeline, is say, oh, okay, we're going to take a day off. We're going to taper you. Why am I looking at you now? I'm talking to her. Anyway. I'm trying to type <laughs> notes for everyone, too. Oh, okay. okay. 
So what I don't want to do, Allison, is like think about like having to taper a, a guy and then, you know, take a whole day to test him and then, you know, have to take another day or two off. Like a lot of days I'm just going to work it into to a training day. So if I've got like in the summer, I had some really good like twosomes paired up for basketball. So I'd be like, oh, hey, this guy's looking fresh today. You know, let's just let's just test and see where they're at, you know. And so like once a month, maybe we would test um, their vert. Maybe we test their 10 yard dash. It just depended on what, what kind of goals we were chasing with them. So, and, and I don't think, <sighs> trying to give you a good answer here. So also like, like if you're chasing force, right? Like if you're using BBT, you can check force every single day, right? And see where they're at. And the goal is like, that's the beauty of those mediums. You don't have to have like a, a testing day per se, like, every day is kind of a testing day. You're testing and assessing their readiness. You're kind of monitoring where they're at. And I think if anything, what you're going to do is try and take advantage of their good days, you know? So I don't know if that really answers your question, but like a lot of times I just work it into um, a, a training session on a day when I think they look fresh and when they look good, sometimes it's just on a whim, you know, like, Oh, this guy's, he's, he's looking spry today. He's pretty chatty. Um, let's just, Hey man, let's test your vert and they're athletes. So they're always competitive. They're always up to kind of see where they're at. So does that answer your question? I'll assume that's a yes. Okay. Who else? Who else? Hey, Mike. How do you like to program your uh, your warm ups or dynamic warm ups for your Indy Eleven guys? Oh, it's so vanilla, it's so boring. So generally, what we're gonna do, um, they're set to start at two p.m. So I tell them if they want to roll, they need to get there two to three minutes early. That's on them. Um, that's not guided. They're pro athletes. If they're tight, they should know where they're tight and and kind of how to foam roll. Um, so at that point, we're going to go into just some basic resets. Uh, generally, we're going to do – some guys have specific stuff, whether they've been with me for a while and I've evaled them over an offseason. Uh, some guys I just know kind of where they're at injury-wise or movement-wise, so I'll change some stuff on the fly. But generally, it's going to be something in an all-fours position or like a bare breathing type position just to get some air into the backside, to get some abs turned on. And then we're going to go to the wall and we're going to do something in 90 So literally mostly just a sagittal plane correction. And I'm okay with that. You know, if we get something to reposition them, I know it's better than nothing because just one of the issues I have with the club, I just don't have enough time to do stuff with the guys. And frankly, I don't know if the medical staff wants me all up in their business, giving resets and that kind of stuff to uh, individual guys. So we chase sagittal plane, we try and unlock, then restore a little bit of movement variability, and then we go in. The warm up's very basic, right? It's think something that is going to um, build on maybe the range that they've got from being in the right position, and then we're gonna layer that with something of a movement skill. Okay, so it could be something like a high knee hug, and then we're gonna take that five reps each side, and then we're gonna take that into an A march. Okay, and then we'll go something like, a quad stretch and maybe take that into a B skip. We'll go a single leg RDL and then we'll take that into a scissor skip, you know, and we just kind of build it uh, in that kind of fashion. It's nothing super, super fancy. Uh, if you look at the old school, like movement prep stuff that Mark Verstegen used to do at Exos, I mean, there's, it looks a lot like that, you know, and then uh, at the end, it's something that, I know Ty and I started year one. We've kind of got our warm up that we want them to do, the, the boxes that we want to check, right? You know, and I want to loosen up the major joints, the ankle, knee, hip, shoulder, all that good stuff. And then the last two are whatever you need, right? Just whatever you need. And that's, you know, as a pro, they've got their pet exercises that they've learned, that they love. Hey, man, do whatever you need to do to feel like your body is ready to go, you know? And some guys have the same two every time and they're just the, the movements that they like. Some guys, it's like a little bit different every time because, you know, they're just trying to 
figure out what's going on with their body or what's stiff that day. They're trying to mobilize that, get it moving a little bit better. So nothing uh, super exciting in, in that group setting. And there are times too where I'll, uh, I'll maybe let one of, one of the guys, like one of the captains, do a little bit more, right? Or like sometimes when we were at the pitch, we'd freshen it up a little bit. We'd try and do some races. Um, we'd put some cones out. And we'd do some agility type stuff and then into some sprints. But for the warm up that we do at the gym, it's very basic because you got to think the way the day goes. I mean, they're, they're at the, at the facility at nine fifteen, nine thirty. they practice at 10. They're going to go an hour and a half, two hours. So that's 1130 or noon. They're going to have lunch brought in. They're going to chill for a while. So they've got like a two hour break from 12 until two before they come to the gym. Right. So I'm already getting them on their second workout of the day. It's middle of the week. Generally, Wednesday is a hard training day. So, like, at that point, I just want to freshen them up, get them loose, and then get them in the gym as quickly as I can. How is it building buy-in for to get them into, like, the 90-90 breathing positions and the quadruped positions? It's gotten progressively easier, right? So, like, the first year, part of it was, you know, Ty and I always – I feel like we always had good relationships with the guys. You know, we, we never, we don't, you're always going to have one or two guys that just don't care, right? They don't want to do anything more than what's asked. They don't really care, but we've never really had like just this massive blowback, you know? And so the first year, you know, it was all new. Like everything was new. Um, the club was new. The, the way Ty and I ran things was new. They had new coaches. So, you know, everything was new. So people didn't really know what to expect. So it was just different, right? It was different stuff to them because they were used to doing certain things. But what you find is once you have success with a handful of guys and people start to see those changes, then, you know, they're athletes, right? They naturally want a competitive advantage. So what are you doing? What's he doing with him? You know, so then they start asking questions. So it's gotten progressively easier and easier, like to now, it's just part of the warm up. Like guys don't question it. It's just, they come in and they do it. And, you know, especially the guys that have been with us the longest, you know, those are our biggest advocates. Like, like we've got one guy on our team that the first two years, I mean, you name a lower body muscle group and he had a muscle pull there. Literally. I mean, quads, calves, adductors, he had a muscle pull. And so after his second year, he like fully got on board with everything, right? Like resets, uh, you know, strength training, conditioning. And the dude hasn't had a muscle pull in two years, you know? So it's like you get those wins from those guys and those guys stay there long enough. Eventually it just becomes part of the culture, you know, and that term gets overused these days, but it's like, that's just the culture of how we do things now. Like we're going to reset. We're going to do these things to warm up. There's a certain way we're going to strength train. So anytime you take on something new, I don't know, it, there may not be blowback, but people are going to be wary, right? And the higher level the person is, the more right they have to be wary, right? Because they got to that level without you and without doing this crazy thing that you're asking them to do. So I think if you're trying to introduce something new for you as a young coach, you know, try and find, try and find a way to make it relatable, Right. Make it relatable to their performance, not just don't check your boxes, check their boxes, right? So find a way to make it relatable to them. Start very minimally, like one exercise, right? And then start to build from there. And that's kind of how you start to build that culture, that buy-in with your athletes. I'm giving you some good advice tonight, man. I feel like I feel like I'm giving you good advice tonight. You are. Okay. For sure. Can't tell. You're kind of stone faced right now. Oh uh, no, this guy, I'm on mute too, because like, I I don't have headphones. But oh okay. Definitely, definitely is great advice. I'm okay. Trying to, I'm trying to write stuff down too on my phone. Okay, that's good. Appreciate it. My pleasure, man. Patrick, headphones are like five dollars. <laughs> Just take a flight. He'll give you a pair. <laughs> I try, I'm going to come again for next year's physical prep for sure that was great it'll be awesome man I'm already working on it nice 
We got 14 minutes. Corey, do you have anything? You can you can ask on yours. Lay down. Hi, Corey. Hey, Mike. Um. So, say you know someone has certain pathologies that shouldn't allow them to get in a position that allows them to get in a position they shouldn't. So if they do like a squat or like a deadlift, the exercise passes the eye test, but you know they're kind of faking it. Do you mm -hmm. leave them out of it or regress it, or do you just like leave it as it is? Hmm. Kind of open-ended. The OCD perfectionist in me makes me want to fix those things. Um, but I think you always have to ask yourself, like, how bad is this hurting them? You know, what's their timeline, right? Like if it's a 22 year old kid and they're obviously pathological and I feel like it's something that's going to cause them issues down the line, then I'm going to fix it. If it's a 39 year old pro athlete and he's got two months left in his career, then I may not be that worried about trying to fix it. I may just try and, you know, help him just get through and manage the rest of the year. So you know, my personal philosophy, I almost always want to root out those things. And even if I don't like take massive steps to fix them, I at least want to manage them. And I think that's probably the best way to think about it. I'm not trying to make anybody perfect, but I want to give them better, a better ability to manage some of the, I don't even know if I like the term dysfunctions anymore. Maybe it's the inner Bill Hartman in me coming out. but. Uh, just to manage some of those, those pathologies. Cause I think, you know, eventually if you're, if you're trying to do things at a high enough level, if you're generating enough intensity or you're dealing with enough fatigue, those things are going to catch up to you. So I'd rather try and get ahead of it sooner versus later, but just knowing that the vocabulary for me is more to manage things than it is to truly fix them. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Who else? Jason. Did you guys tell Casey he's getting lunch or dinner tomorrow? Oh, no, he didn't. He might, he just ate, and I know he's kind of sensitive to foods, so he might be in the bathroom. Yeah. TMI. <laughs> That'll be on the internet until the internet ends, <laughs> Casey, yeah. you know. Or when the AI blows up the internet. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Should, are we going to spend the last 10 minutes talking about the singularity? <laughs> no. Uh, I heard you and Bill had a three-hour discussion on water the other night. Which <laughs> Three hours is a little generous, but we've been talking about water on and off for, <laughs> for a while now. My head hurts just thinking about that. It's really interesting. Water, I drink it. <laughs> Corey kind of wants to talk about the singularity. <laughs> I'm kidding. We're not going to do that. Uh, yeah. Who has? <laughs> I want to. Um, Grant Gardas yeah. says that uh, Jim Laird looks like his camera's having some sort of spasmodic attack. <laughs> I didn't know that. Grant Gardas knew that adjective, so that's pretty impressive. <laughs> uh, yes. I, thought it, I thought it was one of my made-up words. <laughs> Anybody got something? Martin, did you think of anything? Yeah, hi. Um, hi, Martin. Hi. Uh, I usually handle personal clients. And it's going to be my first time to handle golf. What golf? advice can you give? Yeah. So I have no clue what to program for it or in general, particularly. Okay. That's an open-ended question. So I would say, I would say you're going to train them like an athlete, right? To start, you're still going to give them the, the basic, movements that you want to try and move them but or move them through like a squat a hinge a lunge a push-up you're always going to try and build those things um, but i think 
as you layer it and as these people get better and better, that's where you're going to have to kind of really understand the mechanics of the golf swing. You know, again, in these cases, I typically defer to Ty because he deals with so many rotational sports athletes. But, you know, for me, the first box I'm going to check is can they control their sagittal plane? So can they control front to back? Because if they can't do that, they're not going to have access to the frontal plane and they're not going to have access to their transverse plane. Okay, so that's like the first box I'm going to check. Can they get air into the back side of their body? Can they shift their weight back? And then once they can do that, then I'm going to start looking at, you know, hey, can they, can they shift frontal plane through their pelvis? Can they rotate their thorax? Um, and that's where you can do a blend of, you know, your traditional like table tests to check IR, to see how well they can fill chest walls, things of that nature. Um, and look, for me, every guy at IFAST right now is probably better at assessing people than I am. And I'm okay with admitting that. Um, you know, if you put people on the table, they're probably all better than me. Um, because a lot of what I do now, I feel is, is just like, I'm going to watch somebody move a lot. And I can tell, you know, where they're restricted by standing them up and watching them move. And I'll start trying to put those pieces together from there. So, you know, I don't know if I have a great answer for you. Um, again, it's, it's kind of general, but I would say start by just building a better athlete right? Teach them all the basic movement patterns that you want them to know and understand. And then from there, then start to train them like a rotary sport athlete. Can they rotate through their hips, right? Do they have IR? Do they have ER on both hips? Do they have IR and ER on both shoulders? Can they rotate their trunk in a semi-symmetrical fashion from side to side? You know, so those are the first things you're looking at. And if they don't have access to those movements, that's probably where I would start is just trying to unlock the motion first. Cause I think too often people want to chase the performance aspect of things first. You know, they say, Oh, it's a golfer. I'm going to train rotary power. Right. And they're starting to build all this rotary power on top of, a, 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 um, on top of a foundation that can't rotate. Right. Or that's faking or cheating rotation or cheating frontal plane action. So I think that's where I would start is just trying to figure out, um, you know, where they struggle to move um, based on the needs of their sport. And then I basically reverse engineer it from there. Does that help at all? Yep. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Ty or Lance, if you guys want to pop in there, you guys are welcome to uh, throw down. Um, Martin, I think taking like Mike's advice is really good because Everyone's looking for like a sports specific training program, but the same movement principles underlie all sport movement, whether it's volleyball, baseball, basketball, swimming, football, it doesn't matter. And so, um, again, getting them just to kind of reiterate what Mike said. So I wouldn't get too caught up on, on that. It's golf. I would just say, okay, I understand in golf that I have to have trunk rotation. I understand in golf that I have to be able to load both hips at different times in the swing. I understand in golf that I'm going to raise my arm overhead with a club. So that's going to uh, um, create a larger extension moment through the trunk, you know, the rib cage and the spine with that club overhead. So basically with that, the ability to load both hips and unload both hips, the ability to rotate your trunk either way, and the ability to resist extension with a longer lever, that's basically it. And I, I'm, I'm simplifying this, but I'm, I'm like, honestly, like when you start peeling back the layers of training for rotational sports and specifically golf, that's about it. And, um, and you can put any kind of exercise you want on top of those concepts um, that achieve those. So I don't think it gets super complicated. I, uh, I really like that, and we um, we filmed a video that I did, man, it's over a year ago, I think, called Training Golfers, and I linked to it in here, and I'll put it in the uh, the notes for anyone watching the recording. <clears throat> I think I watched that one. It was really good. I mean, Martin, I think you pick up a lot of stuff, and yeah, I don't know. People People get paid a lot of money to make stuff really complicated, like understand the concepts, and then start to reverse engineer it from there.
I'm really glad uh, I joined you guys because in my country, we don't have any access for this kind of tips or any more information for me. Well, hey, man, we're happy to have you. I'm glad you made it on. Hey, um, hey, Martin, one last thing. This is why I have to tell myself this sometimes. Like, we aren't sport coaches. Our job is to give our athletes the tools to perform in their sport. If this guy or girl needs help with their golf swing, that's not our job. Our job is to allow them to do the movements with power or whatever they call us to that, that their sport is going to demand of them. And so um, if you give them the tools that we just talked about, then their sport coach should be able to, if they have a good one, cue them into being able to use them. And that's where if you can communicate with their sport coach and develop a relationship there, um, it would best serve that athlete if they have one. Um, and, I, and it might lead to a, a, a referral source for you, so like a pipeline. So that sport coach may say, oh, well, Martin's really good at this. He understands this stuff. Um, now I'm going to send him all my golfers. And I don't know if you want that, but uh, um, I would just understand that it's not all your responsibility um, to make this guy or girl's golf swing great. Uh, it's, it's your responsibility to allow them to move better and then move with force and power and, and, and so forth. Um, but then it's the sport coach's responsibility to get them to apply that to their game. That was good. Any that other good. addendums? Is it? Damn, it always goes fast. It's because you're cause talking. You're... Yeah, it's true. Right, one, one follow you're not up. monologuing for an hour. That's okay. I had one follow up on working with golfers. So, I mean, someone like a golfer would probably be inherently asymmetrical because they probably swing in one direction. Um, how do you, would you address that? Would you try to make them more, or how would you address that? Would you try to make them more symmetrical, or would you? I guess I could end the question. Here, here's the word of the day. Here's the word of the day. It's manage, right? You're never going to, what are you going to do? Have them swing a thousand times the other way, right? Like you can't do it, right? You can't offset it. So your job is to manage, you know, the body as best you can. I think the biggest thing that you can do is continually, another word that I like to use a lot is just unlock, right? Because what happens is you get so patterned, you get so stiff you get stuck in these patterns, right? So like unlock the body so that it can do the best that it can to go through the range of motion that it wants to go through. Like, I think that's the best thing you can do. Um, you know, is it going to hurt you to throw in some extra med ball throws going the other way? Probably not. But, you know, at the end of the day, I just question like how big of a difference is that going to make? Not nearly as much as, you know, making sure that you're doing the right things recovery wise that you're making sure you're unlocking them from a biomechanical perspective, you know, giving them movement options. Um, I think those things are going to be far more valuable than trying in vain to, uh, you know, balance somebody out that's doing this grossly asymmetrical sport. And when you say unlock, are you trying to regain uh, range of motion that's like normal? Or just, just, just repositioning, just repositioning the body, right? So like just trying to make sure that they've got IR, you know, at the, the hips and the shoulders, trying to make sure, you know, they can extend their hips, just, you know, the basic things that, that every athlete needs, right? Um, it's just like there's, there's a couple ways that athletes get beat down, right? It's either with intensity or it's with repetition, you know? So I'm just constantly trying to give them more movement options so they don't get stuck in one pattern or one position because ultimately if you get stuck in those postures or those positions, that's when either intensity catches up to you or repetition catches up to you. You know, it's one or the other. So it's just constantly giving people movement options so they're not wearing out the same, you know, uh, joint structures or they're not wearing down the same uh, tissues. It's like giving them options so they can balance the load and hopefully – stay at it as long as they want to. Got it, got it. Ty just messaged me saying that 
they actually do both sides in the swing. I, I actually didn't think about that. that they, they do the back swing and then they do the yeah, yeah. They are going through, I guess, both. Sure. Those things. Thanks, Ty. Thanks, Mike. I'm waiting for the Q&A with Ty on just Rotary Sports for an hour. I'll tune into that. It won't be long enough. What do you mean it won't be long enough? It's going to need to be at least three hours. Oh, that's true. All right, guys. I'm okay with that. Uh, Mike, do you have any uh, parting words? I feel like the theme today was manage things. Don't necessarily try to be a hero, but do what you can and yes. work on your rap. Uh, yes. Work on your sales pitch. Any final thoughts on that? No, I mean, you're always working on your rap, right? You're always trying to find a way to make what you do relatable and to connect the dots for your clients and your athletes. I think that that is a huge piece of what we do. And the more relatable you can be, not just a human being, but the more you can relate what you do back to how it's going to benefit them, the better it's going to make everybody's lives. So I'd say that is huge. And then, yeah, I think the management piece, like we get so caught up in, you know, trying to make people perfect. And it's part of what we do. It's part of why we're into coaching. It's part of why we're passionate about it. We want to make people perfect. We want them to move perfectly. Um, and we just kind of have to understand that like inherently from the inside out, we're asymmetrical. We're never going to move perfectly. The more asymmetrical your support, your sport, the more asymmetrical you're probably going to be. So it's not trying to make anybody perfect or make them 100% balanced or symmetrical. It's trying to manage the asymmetries, manage the body better so that athletes can go out, they can train at a high level, compete at a high level, and hopefully dominate whoever they're going up against. So just my two cents on training athletes and being a boss coach. I love it. All right, guys, thanks for joining. And I'm going to upload these notes to the uh, IFSU web page thing. And I'm sure you guys will see that coming out later this week. And as always, if you like this, watch the next one. Bye, friends. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Lance. Thank you, see you guys.